So we go to school to learn things that we'll need to know in the world. But what does that mean? What is this theory? And what is the point? How can it help us think well? Well, a review here, your mind holds concepts, concepts developed through abstraction, you judge propositions, you make decisions, you follow logic with valid reasoning. And our position is that school learning can help you think. But wait a second, school learning? Hmm. But anyway, concepts. In part one, we said that they could be either fuzzy or clear. In part two, we talked of these concepts as universals, not just knowing more facts, but knowing them differently. Still, how do we learn anything anyway? Well, through sense experience, of course. We receive information through our senses. Our brains turn this data into ideas and other ideas, ideas that bounce around our heads. Well, that's what everyone else has thought for the past 250 years since Kant. It is not our view. In our view, ideas are not just related to other ideas. Please excuse us if we break free of our own head. In our view, we use ideas to understand the world. A concept in your head corresponds to that same concept in the world. Notice how demanding our view called realism is. It requires a real dog, not just a phantom or a projection, a real concept in your head, not just neural connections, not just a list of facts, something real, but there's more. This dog has an essence accessible to our minds, a dogginess essential to all dogs, something that every dog participates in. And we participate mentally in that same essence that dogs participate in bodily. For a realist, dog is more than just a convenient name or a shorthand for a collection of sense data. It is present both in our minds and in the world just in different ways. It exists in the world. It is known in our minds. And if you don't like that, consider F equals MA, that equation. It exists in our mind and it happens in the world. In the world, F equals MA makes this or any other physical system do what it does. Just like a dog's essential nature, its identity makes it what it is. In our mind, we use F equals MA to make sense of the system just like you would use your concept of dog to find meaning in a dog's actions. Now, wait a minute. Dogs and equations are not the same, and of course not, and I'm not saying they are. But to the extent that dogs are knowable, knowable not only by their size and their color, etc., etc., but knowable as dogs, to the extent that they are knowable as dogs, you know them in this way. I'm not really talking about dogs. I'm trying to talk about knowledge here. Number two, choices. In part one, we said that we are responsible for the choices we make. We are rightly praised or blamed for them in part two. We describe these choices as the application of a theory to a concrete situation. But what makes a choice good? Well, its effects, obviously, or, or is that not so obvious? Do the ends always justify the means? Hmm. And what if two people disagree about a decision or its effects? Could they both be right? Maybe they disagree about the facts, or maybe they disagree, or maybe they're applying different theories. We could talk about consistency. Do you treat all similar situations the same way? Well, if you did, that would make your actions internally consistent. Maybe they are consistent with something else, a law book or a creed. But is this all we can say about a choice? Let's return to our three professionals. It's pretty easy to identify the good plumber, the one who gets the water to go where it should. But what about the good doctor or the good lawyer? It's a little bit more complicated than just who charges the highest fees or even who wins the most cases. Taking a page from Plato, we can differentiate between the true doctor and the quack. One might get rich selling snake oil, but she would not earn the respect of other true doctors. Or the true jurist. Consider Atticus Finch or St. Thomas More. The true jurist is guided by, is bound to the ideals of truth and justice. That's what makes them a true jurist, just like the true plumber is guided by the principles or laws of his particular craft. In the same way, the true doctor is the servant of health, even more than she is the servant of her patients. She prescribes what is best for her patients, not necessarily what they want to hear or what is most pleasant. And I can tell you're not convinced. We'll try this. 
We all agree that bad plumbers and quack doctors and crooked lawyers exist. We all agree on that? Fair enough. Logic or reason? In part one, we called man the rational animal. We can do more than just follow our instincts and more than just follow our training. We can puzzle our way out of nearly any problem, nearly any labyrinth. And if abstraction involves moving from the specific to the general, and if choosing involves moving in the other direction, reasoning involves moving in both directions at once, a rule book for how propositions interact, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. In part two, we used logic as the ultimate test of our ideas. Do they work or no? But here in part three, we must admit that the most convincing argument is not necessarily the best reasoned one. And it's not hard to see why. You are not a purely logical creature. There is another pillar to our mental life, and this means making a choice. David Hume said famously that reason is and ought to only to be the slave of the passions, passions or emotions, Benjamin Franklin said, so convenient a thing to be a reasonable creature, since it enables one to find or make, to find or make a reason for everything one has a mind to do. Now, I'm not sure how much to read into those quotes, but for us, the question is, how should reason be used? Is it a tool to see beyond us? to drill to the heart of things, or is it a tool to satisfy our desires, to justify our actions? It is a tough question. How should we judge our concepts, internal coherence or correspondence to reality? How should we judge our decisions, against what standard? And it depends. It depends on whether you believe that there is a truth out there to know, whether we can know it, whether it is worth knowing. Are justice and dog just words, or do they point to something real? Uh, that might be a harder question than you think. And maybe only one is real. Maybe you think only one of these is real, but if so, which one? Think about that. And if that is, although, too abstract a question for you, think about this. How do you identify a dog? Do you collect lots of sense data and then make a reasonable conclusion? Say, I conclude that this is a dog based on all these facts that I conclude it fits into this commonly shared, commonly used definition that's otherwise arbitrary? Or do you just see it and with one act of the intellect recognize it as a dog? And then you can collect more data. Is it a small dog or a big dog, happy dog, angry dog? Do you, How do you recognize a dog? Do you collect the facts or do you just identify it? How do you identify justice? A world where concepts are real is one where they can be beautiful where a choice can be really a good choice, not just good for me personally, and where truth can be discovered and communicated. But it's not the only option. Maybe this world is different. Maybe it's a chaos of unconnected data points where we are condemned to be free, to make our own meaning, to live our own small truth. You can think like that. Now, whether or not you can live like that, that's tough. But these are legitimate questions. One final thing, consider this. If we allow the universe to be on whole, a ordered, a serious place, it will return the favor and allow any small corner to be funny.